overview. Now I want to go through the steps in the process and, and dig into the details a little bit more and just step through each part. So for step one, hazard and ground motions, um, we need soil and hazard curve, um, whether that's site-specific information or whether that's from USGS databases. I assume that we can use USGS databases in most cases. Um, if you're going to do response history analysis, you'll, of course, need ground motions. Um, the simplified method can be used um, as a substitute for that. And then for structural responses, uh, we have two primary options, and I'll talk about the details of, of the simplified method and things like that um, a bit later in the slides. Primary options are do a response history analysis um, or run the P58 simplified method. Overall, in the near future, we're hoping to make the simplified method applicable to most buildings. Um, right now, it applies up to 15 stories and for regular buildings, which we'll talk about a little bit more later as well. Um, but we're actively developing methods to make that simplified method um, apply to taller buildings um, by using sort of a modal analysis approach and so on. So in terms of the structural response step, we have to estimate responses. And the primary three that we're looking at are interstory drift ratio, uh, residual drifts, and peak floor accelerations. Um, if you're looking at uh, shear wall building, you'll also be looking at core rotations in the shear wall and coupling beam rotations um, is specific for that system, but these are the three basic ones that are always used. So the next step is damage prediction and the basic point of this step is if I know that my drift is a certain amount, what's the related damage to each component in the building that's drift sensitive? If I know that my peak roof acceleration, let's say, um, is 0.8 Gs or something like that, um, what's my expected damage to the equipment that's, that's up there on the roof? And there's really two parts to this step. The first part is content. You have to estimate um, or know what's in your building in order to do this. Um, that sounds obvious, but that's um, you know, a step that's, that's non-trivial if you manually input all of the things in your building. So you both need non-structural content and structural content. Um, the P58 process gives what's called normative quantities for non-structural, which are estimates of if you have a typical office building you know, on average, we think that you'll have a certain number of feet of interior partition walls and a certain number of square feet of ceilings and, and so on. Um, so in the software, um, those things are embedded in the process. And also there's, there's methods to estimate um, numbers of structural components and so on um, with some inputs from the user. Once we know what's in the building, then you need fragility curves to describe the damage, right? So this is an example. On the top, it's just an example of, you know, you having to list out what's in the building. Um, on the bottom, it's an example of, for interior partition walls, what the different damage states would be, right? So damage state one, wallboard cracks, damage state two, um, you know, it's crushing occurs, and then damage state three, um, the studs buckle. And if you look at it, right, if you go to say half a percent drift, there's a certain chance that you'll be in, in, in each of those damage states. Um, and later we'll talk about, you know, the process uses Monte Carlo simulation and things to, um, to look at the chance of, of being in each damage state and what the consequences of that are. So now once you've handled what contents in your building and once you've associated these fragilities, um, with each content item, so then you go on to the loss estimation step. And in the loss estimation step, we're basically linking damage to consequence, particularly cost of repair, let's say. So if I know I have a cracked wall board, right, I know that per square foot about how much it costs to fix that. And again, there's a variability in that as well. Um, if I know I have crushing, it costs more to fix because the repair sequence is different. If the studs are buckled, again, costs more to fix because the repair sequence is different. Um, so this last step relates the damage to the repair cost. Um, this step also relates the damage to the repair time, right? So there's amount of time that it takes to fix things. Um, it 
also relates to other consequences in P58 in terms of, you know, safety if the damage to, say, lighting is that it fell out of the ceiling. You know, that has safety implications also that are tracked in terms of injury estimation and so on. So, overall, the four steps of the process are then tied together with, with Monte Carlo simulation. And, and what that means is just we roll the dice a whole bunch of times. So sometimes in the analysis we run it, we'll roll, roll it 10,000 times or something like that. And in each analysis run, you get an SA value. Um, based on that SA value, you get a structural response. And again, there's variability there. So in one realization, it may be 10% above average. In the next realization, it may be 15% below average. And over the 10,000 realizations, it accounts for that distribution. And I don't want to go into the detail of it because um, we'll be here too long. And then if you continue to do the Monte Carlo, then in that realization, there's a certain damage um, for each component in the building and a certain loss and consequence for each component in the building. Um, and then the dice is rolled thousands of times, and then you get a distribution um, of response. And again, for the USRC process, um, we're looking at primarily mean. We're also looking at median for repair time. Um, but it does give you more information about 90th percentile and things that are useful for other applications. And in terms of what it will provide right, with kind of the statistical information, there's quite a few things you can look at, and I'll kind of give the overview of what P58 provides, um, and then talk about you know specifically what we're using for the USRC process. Um, you can look at a scenario. You can say for a magnitude seven, what's the average cost estimated in terms of repair? Um, you could also say for a magnitude seven, what's the 90th percentile? Um, you can say what's the average cost for a 475 year event, um, which is different because that's a ground motion level. Um, not the magnitude and distance. You can also look at 90th percentile cost for a 475. You can look at annualized damage. So that might be um, of interest for insurance folks or something like that. And that process integrates back with a hazard curve and, and there's some, some numerical detail there. You can also break down the contributions of the cost. So you can see where the damage is coming from. Um, if you want to make the performance better, you can look and say, okay, well, you know, my, my partition walls are heavily influencing the repair costs, so I need to stiffen my building up here, you know, use kind of in the, the design process. Um, and that kind of thing can, can be used because you can actually look at where the cost is coming from. And then if you want to get really crazy, you can look at a detailed loss distribution, um, you know, and Basically, those little blue dots are plotting out all of the, you know, 10,000 or whatever number of realizations were run. So for the USRC process, we're really focused on the middle two. Um, we're looking at averages or medians at the 475-year event and tagging off of those in terms of getting a rating. Um, and then also the contributions of costs um, could be useful, though those aren't directly, um, you know, used in the, the rating method. So just again to go through um, what P58 gives, um, and again this part of the presentation is general about P58, so I'm trying to cast the net a bit wider than just what we're using for the USRC process. This is an example here of an eight-story um, ductile concrete frame in LA, and this is a 50-year ground motion. And the average loss is 4%, and this is the breakdown. So you'll see for frequent earthquakes, you know, it's really those drift sensitive partitions and finishes um, that cause the damage. If we go up to a 500 year, 475 year earthquake, now we're getting sort of a bit more balance between partition and finishes versus structural components. And we're also seeing that for this frame building, which, which is a little bit more susceptible to residual drift, um, that does um, have some impact on the loss prediction as well. And then we go up to a 2,500 year, and now, as expected, you're really getting more from the structural and the residual drift, um, though you still are getting stuff from partitions and finishes and so on. Um, so this is just an example of 
the information that you can get out of it beyond just my mean loss is 12% or my mean loss is 15%. Um, you can see where it's coming from in the P58 process. You can also, if you like pie charts instead, you can break it down like that. Um, this is breakdown of the annualized loss, right? So annualized loss is driven by frequent earthquakes. So really the partition walls um, are a big part of that. And then you can look at the same breakdowns for various ground motion intensity levels. So um, this, this plot's a little bit busy, um, but basically the blue line sh shows the average loss growing for increased SA levels. And then the lines below it are the breakdowns showing where that loss comes from. So basically a slice of this plot here um, gives the bar charts that we looked at earlier. Um, so you can see the breakdowns, but you can also see how those things change over ground motion intensity level. So that's for repair cost. We can look at the same thing for repair time. So this is the same building example. Um, this is looking at the ready repair times, which we'll talk about in detail um, a few slides forward in terms of where those come from. But there's really three phases to, you know, building repair recovery, right? For a 50 year earthquake, it's saying that it's going to take about a month to reoccupy and about a month to get to the functional recovery state, and then about three months to get to full recovery. If we go to the 475, we're talking about six months for reoccupancy, six months for functional recovery, nine months for full recovery, and then at a 2,500 year, you know, we're talking a year ish in terms of um, getting back in the building and, and getting it functional. Um, and we'll talk about where the aspects of the ready um, repair time calculation in some more detail, but this is just an overview of, of what you get in terms of the outputs. You can also, again, look at how that changes over ground motion intensity level. I'll skim by this. I don't want to get into the detail. Um, this also shows comparisons to some, some raw P58 um, results, which I'll mention later as well. You can also look at fatalities and injuries. Um, I didn't do the bar chart breakdowns, um, but this shows how fatalities and injuries on average um, will grow with increased ground motion intensity. But you could make bar charts of this as well, if you'd like, in terms of whether it comes from falling hazards or collapse or those types of things. And really, there's a lot there in the P58 method. Um, so you can dig into it and get a lot of information. I've talked a lot about sort of the statistical information, 90th percentiles, averages, um, talked about the breakdowns. But the P58 database also provides um, pictures of the damage, right? So for communication, you can look at what, say, the mean damage state is for your slab column connection, right? Hopefully it doesn't look like this. It might if your building's old. But you can look at that and then you can go back into the, the database and grab the picture of that to communicate, you know, if, if you do a code compliant design, this is what it will look like at the design earthquake. Um, you know, same with partitions and, and non-structural and so on, you know, other pictures of, of specific partition damage. Um, again, you can dig into breakdowns of where loss comes from um, and communicate that in various ways. So to summarize the P58 kind of process and, and what I see the benefits to be, the process is standardized and I would call it objective, right? It's, it's based on a, um, you know, knee bone is connected to the leg bone kind of approach in terms of connecting hazard to response to damage to loss. And there's also a standardized component fragility and cost database. Right, so it takes, you know, kind of out of the equation, people just making up whatever numbers they want in the assessment process and, and bring some more standardization to it, which is good in terms of repeatability of the analysis and so on. It's detailed enough to account for the building specifics, which I think is a big differentiator. Um, if you use other methods, you know, have this ATC 13, um, other proprietary methods, they're based on averages, you know, and then there might 
you know, be checklists to sort of tweak. You know, I think it's a little better than the average or a little worse than the average, but it doesn't get into the detail of what if I increase the seismic gap on my stairs, right? How is that going to help me with, with reducing the stair damage and helping with egress? You know, what if I um, make my shear wall a bit stiffer? How is that going to affect expected damage on my slab and column connections? Um, those types of detailed things um, you can look at in the P58 process, which, I mean, it's obviously helpful for new design because you have the power to change things, um, but also for retrofit, right, because you can you know, look at different retrofit schemes and so on, and also for evaluation so that you can understand, you know, where the damage is, is coming from and what you might need to do about it. And then, like I said, there's a lot of, you know, graphics and breakdowns and tools and things uh, for communication and, um, and for assessment reports and things like that. Okay, so that concludes the basic kind of overview and details of the P58 method. Um, I'd like to now jump into USRC rating specific.